Hi there, Hope Church Newham. My name is Andy Frost. I've been friends with Mark Waterfield for a number of years now. And it's great to be able to share with you guys this morning as you continue to explore the Psalms. I love the Psalms, how they give us a framework for how we can engage with God in the very different seasons of life. We're sharing this morning from Psalm 51, one of my favourite Psalms. But just before we do that, context is really important. One of my favourite authors is called Dean Cozones, and he writes a story about how one day he's ordering a pizza for himself. But rather than ordering a personal pizza, he orders a massive family pizza. Then he orders a massive dessert all for himself and a massive flask of coffee. The guy on the phone is saying, do you really want all this food for yourself? Yes, says Dean. And can you deliver it to the edge of a highway at midnight? The guy on the phone is quite perplexed. What is going on here? Why is this guy want all this food to be delivered by the edge of a highway for himself at such a late time? And then you discover that Dean Cozones is an ultra marathon runner. He's running 130 miles through the night and he gets the pizza and he rolls up in one hand, the dessert in the other hand, and runs off into the night munching away on his food. Context is really important. And with Psalm 51, we have a little bit of context. It says, when the prophet Nathan came to him after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. This is the context. You'll find it in 2 Samuel 11 and 12. What happens is this. David, one evening, King David, the king of the entirety of Israel, who should have been at war fighting, is instead spending a nice spring evening on the balcony of his palace. When he looks down and he sees a beautiful lady bathing. Rather than looking away, he begins to look some more. And then he, he inquires as to this lady's story. He discovers that she's married, but he summons her anyway. They end up making love. She gets pregnant. And then the king has a choice to make. He tries to hide away what he's done by trying to encourage her husband to sleep with her. It doesn't quite go to plan. And instead, King David has the woman's husband killed as he's fighting on the front line. Then Nathan the prophet comes and confronts David. And suddenly David realises just what he has done. And this psalm is his response, his prayer, his anguish written down for us 3,000 years later that we can understand how he felt and how he engaged with God. We all think of David being a great king and a great man and a great hero, and he was. But it can happen to us all. David made mistakes, and this was one of the big ones. We're going to start in Psalm 51, verse 1. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. A few years ago, Galaxy Ice Creams had a big advertising campaign where they advertised seven different flavours of ice cream with the seven deadly sins. I think it's interesting culturally how we often look at sin. We think of little sins that we have, little sins that we do. And yet this psalm really takes seriously the importance of sin. It is saying that sin is no joke. There are actually 50 different words used for sin in the Old Testament. And there are three main metaphors. And what happens actually in verse one and verse two of this psalm, David picks up on all three metaphors. The first is this, blot out my transgressions. 
a transgression is when we break a law, when we rebel against a law that is put in place. A sense of guilt means that we need to be forgiven. When I'm um, with my wife, and I've made a, a promise to be back by a certain time, I've made a law, and I'm running late, I'm often running late, and I break that law, I have a sense of guilt. But second of all, in verse 2, wash away all my iniquity. Iniquity is the idea of something being bent out of shape. A sense of shame that has to have restoration. One of my kids, she does things wrong, she often goes away and hides. It's a sense of absolute shame. We have to go to her and to restore that relationship with her. Also in verse 2, cleanse me from my sin. A sense that we miss the mark. That often we can feel dirty, we need to be cleansed and washed clean. These three different metaphors are all found at the very beginning of Psalm 51. Holy living begins with a revelation of the seriousness of sin. But more than that, it begins with a sense that actually I have sinned, I have made mistakes, I have done things wrong. In verse 3, David puts this beautifully. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. He owns his mistakes. There is this realisation that he has that he can't hide these things away from God. He tried to hide these things away from the woman's husband and then from other people, but it fails time and time again, and suddenly he realised he can no longer hide these things away from God. And what's beautiful about this story is this, is he doesn't try to make excuses. He doesn't say, well, hang on a sec. I am the king of Israel. I can do whatever I want. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say, well, well, God, you gave me these desires. It's not my fault. You gave me this desire for this woman. It's not my fault at all. Or he didn't say, but God, she was so beautiful. There was nothing I could do about it. He doesn't make excuses. He's aware of his own personal sin. As it continues in those verses, we also see a sense of God's character, God's justice. There is a revelation of sin, a revelation of personal sin, and a revelation of God's justice in verse 4. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. So he sinned against Bathsheba. He sinned against her husband. He sinned against the people. He is the leader of the people and he has sinned against them. And yet he realises that ultimately he has sinned against God. He has broken what it is to be made in the image of God to respond to all that God has done for him. He sees God's justice and he says that his verdict is right, that God is justified. He doesn't try to haggle his way out of things, but he comes to terms with the justice of God. But what's also beautiful about these verses is actually in verse 1. We see that he understands the justice of God, but he also understands the love of God. Verse 1. O oh God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. He knows the justice of God, but he also knows the love and the compassion of God. If God would not love, he'd be doomed. If God would not love, this prayer would be pointless. If God would not love, he'd be off trying to hide it all away. But God is love and God is just. Holy living begins with this sense of revelation of how bad sin is, of our own personal sinfulness, but also of God's justice and of God's love. There are moments in life when things suddenly change. Remember the last day in my school uniform when suddenly I no longer had to wear school uniform ever again. That moment when I first became a parent, I discovered what sleepless nights were really 
like. That moment when after five years of trying to learn how to drive, five different driving tests, I finally passed. I got my certificate. I was able to drive along and look in the passenger seat and there was nobody there. That moment when things changed, I was no longer a pedestrian. There are these moments in life when things change. This psalm is a moment for David. A moment when things change. Let's continue reading verse 7 onwards. Cleanse me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Holy living isn't just about a momentary prayer we pray, but this sense of being transformed and being changed. Again, there's lots of symbolism here in these verses. As David talks about the symbol of the hyssop, that was often uh, sprinkled by the priest with purifying water in Numbers chapter 19, verse 18. And then the idea of being washed, of being thoroughly scrubbed clean. David wants to be made right with God again. And we get a sense of this emotion that even his bones felt that they had been crushed. You see, David knew that his heart was always inclined to do what was not right. He always had this desire to do what he wanted rather than what God wanted. We often talk in our culture about freedom. Freedom to do whatever we want to do. But we often don't talk very much about how we get freedom from the desires we have for the things that we don't want to do. In this psalm, David seeks the help of God. He wants to be made new, to be changed, to be transformed. He wants it to happen in his heart. And he comes to God knowing that God is the only person that can do this. In verse 10, create in me a pure heart. That word create is the Hebrew verb bara, which is also used in the Genesis 1 story, in the sense that God created. And it's the idea that only God can do this. David realises that only God can create in him a new heart. No other thing can do it for him. It has to be a God thing, God's spirit at work in his heart. He wants to renew a steadfast spirit within me. David is willing to be transformed and changed. Ultimately, it isn't about just being made clean, but it's about being put right again with God, being in a right relationship with God again. In verse 11, do not cast me from your presence. I imagine David was thinking back to that story of Cain and Abel in the beginning of Genesis. Cain kills Abel and then Cain is banished from the presence of God. David is saying, please, Lord, don't banish me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. I imagine David was thinking back to Saul, the previous king, and how he'd rebelled against God and how the Spirit of God has stopped resting upon him. David is saying, please don't let your Holy Spirit be taken from me. But instead, verse 12, he says, restore to me the joy of your salvation. The joy of your salvation. And grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. There's a sense here of humility. Of choosing to be reliant upon God. This sense of relationship. Holy living begins with this revelation of our sin and our mistakes and of who God is. But holy living continues with this sense of being transformed and changed as God works in our lives, as we get our hearts right before him.
Let's continue reading those next few verses of Psalm 51. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, so that sinners will turn back to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, you who are God my Saviour, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. You, God, will not despise. May it please you to prosper Zion, to build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in the sacrifices of the righteous, in burnt offerings offered whole. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. Holy living begins with that sense of repentance. Then it's this sense of being transformed. But actually, when we begin to live out holy lives, it begins to impact the world around us. I love uh, watching live football. I took my daughters last year to go and watch a game at Wembley, watching the England women's team. And it was to watch the few rows in front of me as this person looked around like this. Put their hands up, stood up and sat down. Then the same thing again, whispering. And within moments, the entire stadium were doing the Mexican wave. It's the amazing impact that one person can have. Our lives can be impactful when we are living out holy lives before God. We find in verses 13, 14, 15 that it's something about the words that we say, the stories we tell. Verse 13, I will teach transgressors. Verse 14, my tongue will sing. Verse 15, my mouth will declare. I love it when people first come to faith. They have a real passion about sharing their faith because they realise what it is to be set free, to be set free of all that guilt and shame and, and mistakes, to be set right with God. They're talking about it with everybody. But as we progress in our Christian world, the danger is we become more and more ordinary and we forget what it is to be fully forgiven by a God who cares and loves for us. To recap that idea, that holy living impacts the world in the words that we say. But it's also in the life that we live. He makes it very clear in verse 16. David says, you do not delight in sacrifice or I will bring it. Adultery, the consequence was death. There's no kind of thing you could sacrifice to sort out adultery. It was death in the Old Testament. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. David knew that no religious offering was going to be enough for him. What he realised was actually, more than anything else, God wanted him. Rather than just religious activity, God wanted him and his heart. And in verse 17 it says, My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. The word contrite there means genuine. It's a deep sense of sorrow. You, God, will not despise. We often talk about the word repentance in church. Repentance is the idea of a turnaround mindset, a turnaround life, things going differently. That as we experience God's grace, we choose to live our lives differently. And we say thank you by giving him our lives, by saying here is my life. As we live out our lives, people are watching our lives. As a Christian, people will look at your lives and think there is something different about you. Something that needs an explanation. I remember a few years ago, I was working as a tour guide on this kind of summer camp thing. And then um, towards the end of the time there, someone discovered I was a Christian. Said, ah, oh, you're a Christian. That makes so much sense. That's why you did this and this and this. They understood when I, became, when I revealed that I was a Christian, that my attitude, my behaviour, the way I lived my life was different because I had a faith in God. Finally, it impacts not just the way words we say, it impacts not just the way we live our life, but it can actually impact our spheres of influence. King David was king of Israel. He had a massive area of influence. 
In those final few verses, it says, May it please you to prosper Zion, to build up the walls of Jerusalem. That as David gets his life back on track, the implications are huge for the people of Israel. And as we choose to live out our lives in a holy way, responding to who God is, our lives can have an impact in our spheres of influence as well, as you make the right decisions before God. Psalm 51 is a call to each and every one of us to holy living. It begins with that sense of revelation. And perhaps even this morning, by his spirit, he wants to reveal to you afresh the seriousness of sin. Perhaps you've got things that have been buried or hidden away, which really are still impacting you, that have to be dealt with. Perhaps you need to remind us again of that sense of personal guilt, that personal sin that God wants to set you free from. Perhaps this God reminds you again that he is just and he is love, the character of God. Holy living begins with this revelation of who God is. It continues this sense of being transformed and changed. Have we perhaps at times become stagnant in our relationship with God? Have we forgotten just what God has done for us? Perhaps this morning is about opening our lives afresh to him and saying, God, would you challenge me afresh? Would I not grow stale? Would you convict me of the things that need to be sorted out in my life here today? And finally, holy living begins to impact the world around us through the words that we say, through the lives that we live. Let's expect God to do things even this week as we invite him into our everyday. Psalm 51 has that symbolism of the hyssop, this little herb that often Jews even use today when celebrating the Passover meal. And they sprinkle it with blood. There is this sense that in the Old Testament, whenever there was sin, the only way it could be dealt with was by the shedding of blood. And that Passover meal that Jesus shares with his friend, he probably had the hyssop there with the blood. Yet the next day, Jesus goes to the cross. And ultimately, it's through his death and his resurrection that we can know that all of our sins are forgiven. Our guilt is taken away. Our shame is taken away as we will reconcile with who God is, that we are made clean again. This morning, what is it that God is speaking into your life? What is it that perhaps you need to get right before him? Let's pray. Follow God right now by your spirit. If there's things that aren't quite right in our lives, would you convict us? Will you show us things that are perhaps not quite right? Things we've hidden, things we tried to cover up. Right now we bring them before you, the God who is a God of justice, but who is also a God of love. And we thank you that you meet us where we're at. And that because of your son Jesus, his death and resurrection, that we can know your forgiveness. We can have our shame taken away, that we can be washed clean again. Help us, Father, empower us by your Spirit to live out holy lives in our communities that reveal more of who you are and what it means to be loved by you. In the name of Jesus. Amen.